Thanks for staying with us. Now to our very first story. A member of the 1979 revolution, Major Kwejo Bwachajan, retired, has defended comments he is accused of making against the Lecture Commission of Ghana. He said he is not part of a class of people who deny making statements attributed to them. Major Bwachajan retired, spoke at um, Babieniha in the Bono region with our correspondent Larry Parquisimosis. Attempt to compile a new register in an election year is extremely misconceived and misdirected and can be counterproductive. So the best thing to do to save all of us from angst is to prevail the, the forces that are in a position to do to prevail on the electoral commissioner to back away from it. And resort to the constitutional provision. I think it's Act what for the left my constitution. But if you go and consult that at, at, at uh, Article 43, says that 1992 Constitution will have one uh, electoral rule that will be updated from time to time by deleting and insertion names that are qualified to be there. You don't ask for an overhaul, a new registration, which is different from amendment of the existing one. Because if it's an amendment of the system, well, I don't need to go and queue in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the sun to, to register. And number two, given the atmosphere of COVID-19, a lot of people would, would be frightened to go, even if they maintain the social distancing. So it's likely that the, 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 the registry will not be complete in the context of the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, a crisis and that we should take cognizance of all this and abandon it and go for straight amendment by post and I give you this example I mean I, when I was in UK um, I received a letter from the equivalent of electoral commission here uh, pointing out that I live in address so and so with this one number of five of us qualified to vote but we are not on the electoral rule Therefore, they listed all our details that are relevant, were relevant, and all I needed to do was to confirm that I right and send it to them. And I did. And I, on that basis, I qualified to vote in the UK. And I, I, I think, I don't know why we cannot follow that kind of uh, uh, exercise here. Because we haven't created the manufacturing aircraft, but that doesn't stop us from traveling aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? So we must learn to do things that have been done better before us so that we don't need to beat about the bush. Do you still stand by your statement that if K is not taking EC will plunge this country into chaos? Do you still stand by it? No, yes, I, mean, I, I, I gave it in good faith on the premise of what I'm used to do. Remember I was an intelligence officer uh, for about 15 years in the military regime advising uh, the, the, the authorities to take certain decisions. And the issue of intelligence, people don't understand it. It must be timely, it must be usable, and it must be directed at those who need to know. So I said, I'm in a safe hands now, so I can tell you more, for voice and of doubt, of why what I really happened when I was interviewed. In addition to this information, now even elaborate on but I confirm that I still stand by that statement. Yes, on the issue of the COVID, uh, will you say Ghana as a country is managing the the pandemic well? No, I don't say. I don't believe. It. You see, again, I'm speaking this way from the advice of Father Amesoya. We go to war not with half objectives and half plans. <laughs> you know. You go in and say, look, we are going to capture objective at so, so, and so, and so, great reference, so, so, and so, and so. A good commander says, I'm giving you four hours. Good luck. You know, the time limitation and clearly defined objective. It should have been a total lockdown for a limited period so that, one, those who are sick identify, those who are not identified, those who are at risk, devolve from the pattern of those who have been affected, also is established, so that we can prescribe targeted solutions. 
Now, if you say you are giving 600 million, you don't know who they are. How do you arrive at the figure? You see, so it's all wrong. I call it uh, Galamse, you know, solution won't help. We should consider the fate of the people here first. We should put the people first before property and profit. And that's my beef with this book. Otherwise, it causes you gambling, and it's also a half measure. You can't say I've knocked down halfway, I'm going to lift it and come tomorrow and do this. People are dying. And you cannot retrieve them. You cannot recover them. So there should have been one-off period timeline, stated, clearly stated objective that we are going to do X, Y, Z, which is measurable and calculatable. This has not happened. And I get worried. Thanks for staying with us. Now, a section of Assembly members perceived to be sympathizers of the opposition National Democratic Congress in the Takwa and Swayam Municipal Assembly in the Western Region were today allegedly prevented from taking part in the confirmation exercise of Municipal Chief Executive MTE nominee Benjamin Kessie. The Assembly members, numbering 22, were reported to have been prevented from entering the voting grounds by heavily armed policemen, allegedly on orders from above. Angered by the perceived illegal confirmation process, the affected Assembly members have marched to court to seek an injunction on the confirmation of the confirmed MCE Benjamin Kessie from holding himself as Municipal Chief Executive. Now, we'll bring you more on that in our subsequent bulletins. But let's go to Tema now, where the Tema Regional Police Commander, DCOP Edward Johnson Akrofi, or Yurfi, has revealed his command as moving a motion in court to enable the police isolate and treat 10 suspects who tested positive to COVID-19 in the police cells in the region. He told the media other inmates who were in the cells with the suspects have meanwhile tested negative and have been transport, transported to anchor for prisons. How many they say inmates did you count there? For you to say congestion. But as for cells, how do you practice social distancing? Put it, put it them at risk. I don't think that we are putting them at risk because they are not getting in contact with the general population. So I should think that even being there, they are automatically quarantined and in, in isolation. So it is even better to be in the cells as at now than to be roaming about. No, as for you, as for we, our police duties, you know, the counter NCOs and then the uh, uh, station orders are there to attend to them. And they are, they are, they are, they are, they are, we have started the process. Both the Kuan, the this in the court has given the directives. So yes, he's been taken to Ashama. Uh, and as I'm speaking to you now, Ashama people, they are in court to move the motion. Okay. But those who tested negative, they have been transported to, they say, uh, anchor for uh, prisons, which is a designated prison for that matter. Government has granted a special request from the government of Kuwait to deport some 245 Ghanaians who are illegally living in Kuwait. Information Minister Kujopo Nkrumah, who made the announcement, said the deportees will arrive in Ghana on Saturday. The deportees will be arriving via a special charter arrangement at the cost of the Kuwait government. The deportation comes at a time when Ghana's borders remain closed to human travel as part of international travel restrictions under Ghana's COVID-19 response program. According to Information Minister Kujo Opon in Kruma, the deportees will be quarantined and attended to under strict supervision at the cost of government upon arrival. The National Security Secretariat has been instructed to work in collaboration with the military, the immigration and the police to take responsibility for ensuring that the mandatory quarantine is adequately enforced. The Ghana Health Service 
He's been asked to take responsibility for the testing and, if need be, treatment of these deportees. Deportees who test positive will be given the necessary supportive treatment. Deportees who test negative will remain in quarantine for a second test at the end of a 14-day quarantine period. He further indicated that deportees will generally be received and handled in line with immigration regulations for all deportees. They will be in the custody of the state for preliminary investigations on the circumstances of their illegal stay in Kuwait. It is upon the completion of these investigations that a case-by-case -case determination will be made on the status and further handling of each deportee in accordance with Ghana's laws. Government has assured the general public that measures to ensure the health of the general population and sustained gains made in curbing COVID-19 will continue to be upheld. Now let's move on to health, where the fight to end obstetric fistula, one of the most serious and tragic injuries that can occur during childbirth, could be threatened by the current pandemic of COVID-19. Obstetric fistula is preventable. It can largely be avoided by delaying the age of first pregnancy. The cessation of harmful tradition practice, traditional practices and timely access to obstetric care. The current pandemic has, however, affected all the preventive measures in developing countries where obstetric fistula still exists. Due to COVID-19, it is expected that 13 million more children, uh, more child marriages could take place by 2030 than would have otherwise. Families are more likely to marry off daughters to alleviate the perceived burden of caring for them, especially in the anticipated economic fallout of the pandemic. The pandemic is also expected to cause significant delays in programs to end female genital mutilation, FGM. Now, we've been joined by a lawyer, uh, a doctor, rather, Dr. Gabriel Yao Kuma um, Ganyaglu. I hope I got your name right, to, to share some light on obstetric fistula. Uh, first of all, how does this condition present itself? Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to your viewers. Obstetric fistula, as you have alluded to earlier, is still a very important maternal health condition in our country and it's largely a result of a prolonged obstructed labor by which I mean the woman goes into labor and the baby just doesn't come out and gets stuck in the birth canal and once that happens over a few hours then you find that the an abnormal communication develops between the reservoir for urine and the reservoir for feces and once the hole develops, then urine continuously tracks through the bed canal or feces tracks through the bed canal for that matter. And the woman is continuously leaking and continuously smelling of urine and of feces. Mm, this is uh, quite a serious one there. What's the status of this condition in Ghana? Um, have we recorded a lot of cases? Yeah, we did some studies. Uh, about five years ago and then more recently last year and we still have uh, fistula in our country in our estimation about 1353 new cases of fistula occur every year mm. it's difficult to estimate how many uh, fistula cases are pre-existing because primarily these patients are in hiding due to stigma due to humiliation due to ostracism and the various myths and misconceptions about fistula they are not easily identifiable, they are in hiding, so it's difficult to actually know exact numbers of cases that are already existing. But we do know that every year we record a significant number of obstetric fistula cases. Over the years, we have done our best, given the limited resources available, to repair as many as we can, but our efforts, fortunately, are only able to reach about a hundred or so patients every year. So we do think that we have a substantial backlog of fistula cases in Ghana. Right, now is every woman susceptible to this condition or are there women who are more vulnerable to obstetric fistula? 
That's a very good question. The research we have done indicates that fistula is affecting all regions of Ghana. It's affecting all women. No particular age is spared. However, it appears to be more common in the younger ages and those who start early childbearing. That is why childhood marriages and teenage pregnancies, as much as possible, should be avoided because it does appear as if unless the woman has finished growing and the pelvis is fully developed, it is very... Hello, doctor. Can you hear us? Okay, we seem to be having some challenge with Dr. Yao. When we do establish contact with him again, we will share some light on what roles, for instance, um, families can play to help women who um, are living with obstetric fistula to deal with a condition. We'll also want to find out um, COVID-19 and its impact on the treatment of this condition. And if at all, there's a treatment for this condition. You're still watching Midday Live on TV3. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, establish contact again because it's a very, very important conversation, not just for women, but, you know, for all. Dr. Yao, for instance, cited instances where women who have been married off early or have children early are more vulnerable to obstetric fistula, even though it's a condition that any woman, irrespective of, you know, um, age or location, can have. So we'll take a quick break when we come back. There's more news here on Midday Live. Welcome back. Now, for the first time in history, Muslims in Ghana will not be observing the Eid al-Fitr festival. This is as a result of ban on social and religious activities to contain the spread of COVID-19. The situation has adversely impacted on businesses within the Zungu communities. Ibrahim Abubakar has been assessing how businesses within the Zungu communities have been faring in the face of COVID-19. We are left with just two days to celebrate the Eid al-Fitr festival, which marks the end of the month of Ramadan. Ordinarily, around this time, businesses within the Zongo communities take its peak. But this year, the story is different. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there wouldn't be any Eid al-Fitr celebrations. And this has affected businesses within the Zongo communities. Let's engage with some of them and find out how they are faring in the face of this pandemic. Business is a business. I feel like I'm a company. I feel like I'm a salon. 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 I feel like I'm a Inti affect ye pa, and mum you doing yamiasi, ye tun kum, ya re yankaye, and num pun ku anti ye be doing yamiasi, na yami maya ko fufro na ebe trim in sha Business is not faring quite well due to this COVID nineteen and especially when the government announced there will be no E this year. So it has negatively affected those selling uh, uh, clothes, shoes and the rest. As I speak to you now. We are in the. Uh, we should be in the peak season. So mostly every Ramadan by this time, every shops within the Zongo communities will be crowded with people. But uh, this years tend to be different from the previous years. Uh, previous years. So in the nutshell, uh, it has negatively affected businesses within the Zongo communities and the country at large. Isha, last year and this year, the un compare fi say last year the ne ton e to adi e pa. This year e kase e ndi salano kra. Enti ama ubi e tini fi salano su enti nyaku pa ama udu ya na osu ubi e nsha atadi fufro. Enso se se de ubi e enti minto agensi e pa. Bibi e se bibi e se. Beti e mumpa e ina e ngu sugana fu e mumpa e ne yari e di e unkone e ina e unto e. I'm currently at the hub of tailoring here at the Kumasi Central Market. And around this time, this place is the most busiest place you can ever find because everybody wants to sew a new cloth to put on for the Eid celebration. But the situation is a bit different now. Like at first, now, because of the Eid al-Fatr, ah, we are too busy. Every place, every corner you've been to. But now... Because of the log, 
down and then social distance. They are not coming. As we are here, we are sitting free. No work, no anything. But inshallah, because of uh, Allah, we depend on him. We are sitting, small, small we get, then we take it like that. They say the COVID-19 pandemic has affected their businesses. But for most of them, so far as there is life, there is hope. And they pray to the almighty Allah to bring a solution to this crisis. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3, Kumasi. Meanwhile, the National Chief Imam Sheikh Nuhun Sharbutu has called for pragmatic measures to address the coronavirus pandemic at a brief ceremony to receive essential items from philanthropists ahead of the Eid al-Fitr celebrations. The Chief Imam believes a concerted effort is key in defeating the virus. Muslims around the globe would mark the Eid al-Fitr celebrations after undergoing one-month prayer, fasting and teachings. However, for the first time in more than a century, Muslims will not observe the usual crowded Eid al-Fitr prayers owing to the coronavirus outbreak. Although worries that COVID-19 has wreaked havoc globally, the National Chief Imam Sheikh Noom Sharbutu was optimistic a concerted effort would render a comfortable post-COVID era. With practical measures at the global level and at the national level and in the name of Almighty Allah, at the end, we will not remember the discomfort of COVID-19. Meanwhile, ahead of this year's celebration, some philanthropists have presented some essential items to the Office of the National Chief Imam for onward distribution to communities. Chris Komodo, a philanthropist who doubles as a private businessman, donated 50 bags of rice, 10 cartons of cooking oil and 15 packs of bottled water. The country is so hot. Things are not the way we are expecting it. But I know with prayer, very soon everything will be fine and then we all will live our normal life. Another philanthropist, Freedom Jacob Caesar, who also made a similar donation, urged government to prioritize the development of Zongo communities while using the festive occasion to unify the country. This is time that we address the fact that the northern part of Ghana is the foundation of the country. Based on farming, based on strength, based on support, based on love, these things are the things that makes us unite. And I'm here to acknowledge this moment. To Parliament now, where pressure is mounting on the chairperson of the Lecture Commission to appear before Parliament to update MPs on the working program of the EC ahead of the December elections. The Commission has been embroiled in a lot of controversies, especially with members of the opposition NDC over its decision to compile a new voters' register. MP4 Adaklu Gavin Kwame Agbuja is asking the, ma the majority leader, Osei Che Mensa Bonsu, to table the appearance of the EC chairperson. It has become very topical that people are attributing all sorts of things to the current electoral commission. Elections in this country is a big issue. I have been in this house when we brought Madame Chalice here and uh, in a close uh, a meeting and members of parliament had the opportunity to say as, as electoral, uh, co uh, chair of the electoral commission and we elicited whatever we wanted to do, uh, hear from her. Mr. Speaker, we are going into an election in a few months. We hear all sorts of things about what EC is doing or not doing. I think it's important that the chair of the EC or the Electoral Commission is brought to this house to update members of parliament exactly on what she or the commission is doing to ensure free and fair elections in, in, uh, in December. Mr. Speaker, anything short of this would have been an act, uh, an act of preventing members of parliament, the people's representative, the opportunity to interact with the EC so that we can report back to our uh, constituent to prepare adequately for this year's election. Mr. Speaker, it's a plea I'm making that leadership uh, pr uh, prepare and invite the Electoral uh, Commission to appear before the House so that we can elicit whatever information we want to uh, get from it. 
Well, the majority leader or state chairman Sabunsu says the needful will be done. About the EC to come to the house to update the house on free and fair elections. Uh, I don't know uh, what exactly he means by that. The functions of the Electoral Commission are stipulated in the Constitution, and uh, nothing can be added to that. Regarding um, the the program that they, they intend to follow. Again, that program was set out in the budget that is submitted to us. The speaker, I believe he wants maybe further details, which is what the minority leader requested the other time. And we, we said that we engaged the EC. Um, in fact, even yesterday I did. And they, they indicate to me that they will get back to me today. Indeed, the chairman of the special budget committee also came to me. I said he should also do his own checks, but I have used the straight path to engage. I'm waiting for the response, which I believe would come by the close of day, for us to know exactly when uh, next week, possibly, we shall meet. Um, it's possible to meet in the close sitting or committee of the whole, or perhaps first the special budget committee, which has direct oversight responsibility, who will do what is needful. Now, still staying on this subject, the minority leader, Harina Idrusa, has reacted as well. Now, Speaker, my final one, I drew the majority leader's attention that the Honorable Mahama Yarga have filed a motion for some action uh, uh, pursuant to Article 11 and subsidiary legislation on the Electoral Commission and the instrument before us. I handed it over to the table. Your action on it would be awaiting it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. But the leader uh, said to me at the business committee that he hadn't cited a copy. So I'm sure, table, if it's in the hands of the speaker, when it gets out, let us know his fate. The Deputy National Youth Organizer of the Opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, and a former council member of the University of Ghana, Edem Agbana, has spelled doom for the country's tertiary education should the public universities bill be passed. He says the bill must solve key issues faced by the various public universities rather than seeking to interfere with its administration. You cannot be too sure how government or a particular president will react at any time. When I was a council member, there were several times that we disagreed with the decision of government. When you have a situation where Council disagrees with the decision of government. Government can choose to dissolve the council, pay the investors' bill. What is the motivation? What problem is this bill going to solve? I think that this bill is just a bill that is going to plunge the educational sector into chaos. He says Ghanaians should kick against the passage of the bill because the motives by government are not well intended. The president and the session five of the bill is allowed to nominate a chairperson of the council as well as five others of which two must be women. If you are introducing a bill, let the bill be tailored in a way that it is going to address that specific challenge. How many times have you heard reports of students who don't have access to accommodation facilities? These are the critical issues that government must focus on. What is the bill addressing? The bill for me in my view and in the considered view of many other aspects of education, like all the stakeholders that you have mentioned, is simply a bill to extend government's hand into the management of our environment. When we allow that, I'm telling you, public education will collapse in this country. But public relations officer at the Ministry of Education, Echo Vincent, debunked assertions that the bill will result in government interference with the administration of the universities Government is going to have a role to play in forming university councils and in fact it has mostly it has always been the responsibility of the president of the republic to appoint or if you like to swear in university councils in this country. The only different thing that we are finding now is that we are now going to have external officers on the university council at way. 
the internal offices. Meanwhile, UTAC President Professor Charles Marfo has indicated that they will seek redress in court if government fails to back down on the proposed public university bill. A section of assembly members perceived to be sympathizers of the opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, in the Takwa and Swaim Municipal Assembly in the Western Region were today allegedly prevented from taking part in the confirmation exercise of Municipal Chief Executive MCE nominee Benjamin Kessie. The assembly members, numbering 22, were reported to have been prevented from entering the voting grounds by heavily armed policemen allegedly on orders from above. To share some more light on this. Right, now to share some more light on this, we've been joined on the line by the Assemblyman of New Etiabo, um, Richard. And so good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon, madam. Thanks for joining us. Has voting ended? Yeah, it has ended. Right. What can you report um, as the situation is now? Okay. Can I can I look into my own other account? Well, I'm sure you can do that. Okay, thank you. Yo, Michelle Mamina. I'm Michelle Ganama. Michelle, I'm a president. I'm a co-founder. So now she has a tema. But I'm a cannot continue. Na the record was a for him. I'm water for Mamina. Because the the member and sign, but for the Koti Kwando, I want them Kwando. Was the quick was signing. The chairman member and the signature are on your way. Ah, it's confirmed. The the chairman member. But you won't pay for what you mean, what you put it on the body. I quite sick documents. What's inside? No, what to abide without a notice of an assembly member. Assembly members, no, yeah, yeah, 20 something almost. I don't want to bring out from the figure, but we are 30 30 assembly members for the trade appointees. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Richard and so is the assemblyman of New Etiobo. He was uh, essentially telling us that they challenged the confirmation of Benjamin Kesse because the process um, you know, of electing him was not transparent. You're still watching Midday Live on TV3. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hello, good afternoon. It's time to do sport here on Midday Live on TV3. My name is Yao Ofusulabi. Now, boxing, like many other sports, has been largely impacted uh, by the lack of mainstream professional activity due to the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. But recovery is in, uh, the, is in the making for many boxers eager to get back into the ring. Here's a report by Daniel Yeboa highlighting what some boxers have been up to in this period. So we are here at the Bronze Boxing Gym. 
where boxers continue their daily routine and with the effort to become world champion in the world. Despite coronavirus affecting all sports, but they are ensuring social distancing, they are opening up to the number of boxers here. You realize that quite a few boxers behind me, it tells you that boxing is in a halt, but these boxers are continuing to pursue their dreams. Many of these young talents box and weave around a punch bag, hoping on and off concrete as they practice for what could one day secure them fame and glory. Such is the mentality of former IBF lightweight title champion Richard Comey, who started his career from the bronze boxing gym in Accra. And this coronavirus has changed everything and it has changed uh, the bronze gym, if I have to be specific, and it's difficult. I myself have not been finding it easy, so if you don't take care, you just throw someone away. I still have to motivate them, I still have to tell them that that is not a fault of anyone. So they just have to manage, control and just be, be strong and I mean, I mean be brave and just take it one after the other and I believe these hard days will pass by. The punch bags here have daily company, enough proof of the pugilistic regime needed to stay grounded. For most, it is hit hard and win or go home. Daniel Selassie is certainly afraid of catching the virus, but says it should not be a hindrance to his training routine. I'm seriously afraid, but it's not, it's not because of the corona I cannot train. I always train my personal training instead of coming to the gym. Other boxers like Felix Nuhu and Emmanuel Corti are optimistic of becoming world champions with Ghana producing seven already. And now to some more stories and board chairman of uh, the club licensing board of the Ghana Football Association, Dr. Kwame Banu Akun, says any consideration made for or against the return to domestic football should be informed by research. Now speaking to TV3, he underscored why it is important to adhere to scientific basis than a judgment that only takes into account commercial factors. Any decision to either continue playing the game or not should be based on research. We are looking at what we are losing by playing and what we are losing by not playing. And then let's compare whether we lose more by playing or we lose less by playing. And then you make a decision. I don't believe in people doing things in, in emotion or copying other countries. Maybe the South African clubs, if even they cancel a league, the sponsorship money might still be there. And so they would rather uh, stay at home and pay the players. What if you don't have to sponsor one? The contract with the player is still running. And unless you are saying we are terminating, uh, mutually agreeing to terminate the contract. Whether you want to resume, the players want to play football. Whether in an empty stadium or because they become rusty. And that's their livelihood. If you stop playing football for a very long time, you become rusty. He's lost his source of livelihood forever. So let's not only think about just the club officials. The players are also critical. Now, the Executive Council of the Ghana Football Association on uh, Thursday approved three developmental funds for the Federation. Now, the funds, among others, are set up to help the GFA improve in certain key areas. The funds include the Central Fund, Medical Fund and the World Cup Benefit Fund. The Central Fund will support activities of juvenile football, women's football, RFAs and Medical Fund. The Medical Fund has also been set up to cater for serious injuries to players in the Premier, Division 1 and Elite Women's Division. Also, part of the three is the Special World Cup Benefit Fund which will enable stakeholders benefit from World Cup participation for development projects. For this purpose, 30% of net revenue accruing to the GFA from World Cup participation of the Black Stars shall be channeled to stakeholders. The FA says funding will come from various sources and believes the initiative will ignite passion and create wealth for all in football. 
Well, now Manchester United say the coronavirus pandemic has cost them an initial £28 million and expects the final figure to be far higher. United revealed their third quarter results on the 31st of March on Thursday. Now, uh, Chief Financial Officer Cliff Batty said they are set to hand back £20 million in TV revenue to broadcasters even if the Premier League season is completed. Manchester United lost an additional £8 million over the final three weeks of March when they had to postpone three of their matches. A total of 11 United matches have been postponed because of the pandemic. That's all the sports this afternoon here on Media Live on TV3. International news is up next. Singing in only local languages wouldn't sell your music globally. And that's according to music producer Ball J in his advice to Guinean artists. He spoke on Onu FM's Ifie Nifie with Dr. Prekese. Renowned sound engineer Albert Ayahansen, popularly known as Ball J, expressed worry about the trend. He revealed that if Ghanaian artists insist on singing in the local language despite using American instrumentation, it will be difficult to sell their music on the international market. We have culture music and we have commercial music. Maybe we will make some kind of music, but if one really sell to the music out there and to the world out there, you have to um, fix it with what is commercial out there, and that's called trends. So that's what we do to pick Ghanaian music, our own music, and put it together, and we can sell it out there. If you don't add English to it, and it's just three, then you have to make sure that your instrument are sounding very typical native African. I mean, I sound engineer. But if you're going to use the American instrument and speak Tria, who do on Mombeka say, ah, but you sound just like us. It's no difference. According to him, African arts such as Fela Kuti, Anjali Kijo, and Natongo, among others who mostly sang in local languages, appealed to the international market because their instrumentation had an African feel. Okay, money, sad effects, you ain't chilling, mine is clean. Money. And that's Bojo for you. Now, singer and songwriter Lady J believes a genre of music is yet to be understood by Ghanaians. This, she believes, has hindered her ability to progress in the music industry. She spoke to Anita Ekuya Ikufu. Lightness and darkness, I find my light I shine. Singer and songwriter Lady J has been on the Ghanaian and Nigerian music scene for almost a decade. She has worked with influential artists such as Sarkodie, B.O.J., Efia, Yapono, just to name a few. Lady J bemoaned poor structures in the Ghanaian music industry. First of all, in Ghana, we don't even have a structure. They are motivated by three things. Money, luxury, and sexual, like, Things. There's some artists out there that when they do that for them, it works for them. That's one. Two, wealth. Ah, if you see on Instagram, this person has a car or a Benzo or this or a Beamer. People are attracted, but the reason why maybe I'm not like that is because I'm not like that. The songstress further revealed musicians have lost their passion for making music and are rather influenced by money. Lady J believes she's not progressed in the music industry due to her refusal to expose her body. That's why I think maybe I'm not dead down because I'm not willing to do certain things like shaking your ass or go nude or, or beef or fights. Like, I'm not willing to do any of these things because we oh, are yeah, necessary. I see the freedom, I see the love in and that's Lady J for you. If you want to hear some of her songs, you can always tune into 3FM 92.7. I'm Miriam Mosea. Do have yourself a good weekend.